Welcome to this video on how to start the aircraft design process and perhaps the, one of the best ways to do that is to consider the following parameters which are thrust loading and wing loading. Uh, by considering these two design parameters it is possible to um, generate all of the other required major design variables to spec out and size an aircraft. But to begin with, we'll start with the basics and we shall review what the forces are, which are in steady, straight, level flight under equilibrium conditions, no accelerations in any direction. We obviously have a lift force holding the aircraft up, which is opposed by weight acting towards the centre of the earth. These are in balance, lift equals weight. We've got thrust from the propulsion unit driving the aircraft forwards and that is opposed by drag and thrust equals drag in the equilibrium condition. So therefore if we've got four forces because lift equals weight and thrust equals drag we actually only need to know two of those. So if we take the thrust and the weight for instance we'll be using those. We'll also be considering another parameter uh, S capital S, which is used to represent the wing area, or the planform area of the wing. So from those, we have a definition of thrust loading, which is defined as the thrust to weight ratio, um, which for units, you will notice, is dimensionless, because thrust is a force, and weight is a force, both mothered in newtons, and so this is a dimensionless parameter. Now we compare that to a second definition, which is a wing loading. This is the weight of the aircraft divided by the wing plan area defined earlier. So you'll notice that the units here are going to be newtons per square metre, because weight is the force in newtons and the area S in square metres. So you might recognise that as being the same units as stress, for instance, which is force over area, or indeed pressure. It's the same thing as a force over area. So this is the same, it's really analogous to that. It's a, it's a measure of the intensity of the force over a given area. In this case, it's the, the wing area. So how efficient is that aircraft wing for uh, lifting the weight, for instance, is another way of viewing it. So both the wing loading and the thrust loading are very important parameters. They affect the aircraft's performance and its design. Let's look at some examples. Let's say we've got a very low wing um, loading. To do that, that value W of S needs to be small, which means that the weight has to be small or the area S has to be big. So in other words, we'd have a large wing. So with a large wing, the weight of the aircraft is spread over a much larger area, so the intensity of that weight being spread over an area means that the wing loading reduces. The consequences of having a large wing, or a low wing loading, is that they've got lots of room for putting things into it, such as storing landing gear and all the, me all the uh, mechanics for that, and the fuel tanks, for instance. The consequence of this is that you may have structural issues with having a much larger wing, and the larger it is, the more the drag will be. So now let's look at design example number two. This is the thrust to weight. And now let's consider a very high thrust to weight ratio. This would be achieved by having a large propulsion unit, for instance. Well, the advantage of that is that it will be able to accelerate and climb rapidly. It would have a very high maximum flight velocity, v, for instance. But it's going to consume more fuel, and because it's going to consume more fuel, we're going to have to store more to begin with, which is going to increase its takeoff weight and its efficiency. So you can't have an advantage without having a disadvantage. Let's have a look at number three. Um, so here I'm considering the takeoff distance. Uh, S is the distance or displacement, uh, subscript T over takeoff. So we've got an example here on this diagram. Well, you can estimate that, and I, I, I emphasize this is an estimate equation, it's not an exact one. 
uh, which can be given from this equation here, 1.44 times the weight squared, and on the bottom of this equation we've got here rho is the density uh, of, the, of the gas, the air temperature in other words, the, 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 this is the ring area S, CO max is the maximum lift coefficient, we know anything about airfoils, and that's the maximum um, lift generated from that particular cross-sectional area. Uh, G is the acceleration due to gravity as usual, and D is the thrust. Okay. So a little activity for you, if you would like to engage in this, would be to rewrite this equation in terms of the thrust and the wing loading. So I really would encourage you to pause the video there for a few moments now and have a go at that. Okay, so I'm assuming that you've had a go at that and you've come back to the video. Let's look at the solution. So what do we have here? Well, we have our equation that we want to rewrite in terms of the wing loading. So, uh, and the first loading, so what we've done here, the W squared can be separated out into a W times W here. Uh, and you can see there we've also got the thrust, we put underneath one of them, and the S we put underneath the other. Okay, so almost there, the W over S, that's their wing loading, but this you'll notice is the inverse of the thrust loading because with the thrust loading the thrust is on the top and the weight on the bottom, so we need to turn that the other way around. Um, so if we do that, we can put it on the bottom of the equation and you can see now that we've rearranged the equation in terms of the wing loading and thrust loading. So what are we looking for here? Well, we're looking to reduce the takeoff distance, aren't we? The, the ideal scenario is at a minimum uh, distance to take off as possible. So looking at the equation, to do that, the wing loading, W over S, that will need to decrease. So we need to have a low takeoff distance, we need to have a low wing loading and the thrust loading. Well, the thrust to weight ratio needs to be high, which again that makes sense, because that would mean you've got a more powerful engine. Now then, all of that, what we just talked about, was assuming that the thrust loading and the wing loading are constant. And of course they're not. They're not constant. Fuel is burnt throughout the flight, so therefore the weight is going to decrease. The thrust is going to vary with altitude and velocity. And so therefore, when we're looking at these as design parameters, we need to say we'll agree on what the values are going to be so that we compare one against the other. And so it is fairly standard in this case to take the values at sea level. Sea level conditions under static, i.e. zero velocity, and maximum velocity, uh, maximum throttle. Now, everything we've talked about with the power uh, thrust loading so far actually refers to jet engines. If we've got propellers, we need to talk about power. Um, a power loading is defined, quite confusingly, as the inverse of a thrust loading, which is the weight, divided by the horsepower, HP. So note that those are not SI units. Uh, but typically they range somewhere between 10 and 15 for most aircraft. If we look at propellers, they, they have an efficiency. Uh, and this here this is the efficiency of a propeller. And remember, efficiencies are just what you get out compared to what you put into something, as a, from a systems perspective. So what we're getting out here is a power, um, the thrust power, the available power from the propeller compared to what we put in at the shaft. Uh, and you can see from the graph below that this, this varies depending on the propeller RPM. This is the um, efficiency here just being chopped off. Uh, and from a design perspective, even though that's constant, if you want to simplify matters even further, just from the first design iteration, you could just assume an approximate value of 0.8 for instance. If you want to convert these power loadings for propellers to the thrust loading that we talked about earlier on, then you can use this equation here. Uh, v is the velocity, this is the efficiency of the propeller, HP is the power in horsepowers for the propeller. Note also that this is the inverse, this is 1 over the power loading. So, in this graph, we've got an overview of different propulsion systems. We've got the flight Mach number here. Remember, Mach number is the local uh, velocity uh, 
compared to the speed of sound. Uh, and here we've got the maximum thrust to weight ratio on the y axis. If you consider most transport civil jet aircraft, they tend to fly to a Mach number of around about 0 0.8, 80% of the speed of sound. And so we can find out on the graph where that is, indicated by this green dotted line, and then we can look for the maximum thrust to weight ratios for typical engines. You see that these high values are here are for after burning turbo fans and after burning turbo jets. So these are called reheat. These are not particularly these are for military aircraft rather than civil aircraft. So we come down below. Well, we've got a ramjet, again not particularly useful because they have a much higher they're designed to operate at much higher Mach numbers, typically around about five or so. So really the only feasible options as you come down for the maximum values again are these bypass ratio fans. So we've got a low bypass turbo fan here. Got a turbo jet, which is typically using uh, military aircraft and Concorde, for instance, when it flew. And here we've got a high bypass bypass ratio turbo fan, and then much lower down is the turbo props. Interesting to look at the propulsion system, uh, and this is the efficiency of a propulsion system against Mach number for different engine variations. And again, if we look at a Mach number 0.8, which is where most civil jet aircraft operate, then we can see that the turbo fan design is the one that operates at the, uh, the, the maximum um, efficiency. If we're looking at different engines, it's quite useful to look here. So again, same thing again, if we look at around about 0 0.8 for the Mach number, the turbo fan engines are in this bubble here different values uh, and for lower speeds we tend to use a turbo prop from about 0 0.5, 0 0.4 Mach numbers and then the higher Mach numbers are best served with turbo jets and if you're going to go much beyond Mach 4 or 5 then you'd be looking at some combination of turbo jets and ram jets. Right now let's look in this condition of in the cruise condition, we have we started right at the very beginning by saying the four forces on the aircraft were balanced and that thrust equals drag under those conditions and lift equals weight. So you can easily manipulate these two simple equations uh, in the following format uh, by using thrust over weight. And here you can say the thrust over weight is the inverse of the lift to drag ratio. And lift to drag ratio again is something which is often known for various Airflow profiles and aircraft configurations, or, or, in, or the other way around. So if you know one, it means you can find the other. Again, it's quite a useful equation. Let's look at wing loading now. We talked a lot about the power. Let's look at the wing loading. Um, remember that is the weight divided by the plan area. As with the thrust loading, it does usually refer to the maximum values at takeoff because it obviously varies and it can affect many different design and performance parameters. It will affect the stall speed of the aircraft, the takeoff distance as we've looked, also the landing distance and the performance in a turn and most other parameters. Let's look at the stall speed for instance. We can write down the normal basic equation which you should be familiar with if you're studying a lot of aerospace and aeronautical engineering. We know that lift equals weight and we also know that lift equals a half rho v squared SCL. This is a very familiar equation to most aeronautical engineers. Here I've rewritten it in terms of the maximum CO max, so the maximum CO, sorry, uh, which occurs at the stall speed. Well we can just uh, divide by S on both sides here and if we do so on the left we get the wing loading and on the right we've got the familiar equation. Here's a typical Aerofoil, cambered aerofoil, and you to get the CL graph here. This is the lift coefficient against alpha, which is the angle of attack. Because it's cambered, it means that it crosses the CL axis above zero. So that does mean you can generate some positive lift at negative angles of attack. And the CL max refers to this value here. So, 
let's put all this together and summarise. Turns out that if you look at the thrust to weight ratio for lots of different types of aircraft, and this is something that you would be encouraged to start acquiring data on now, is and if you do that, if you start to find data on lots of different aircraft, find out the maximum thrust and divide it by the weight, for instance, you will find that this value, thrust to weight ratio, has a fairly constant value. And I've got it plotted here for lots of different classes of aircraft, from twin-engined aircraft to four-engined aircraft, and you can see there's not a huge variation in the thrust to weight ratio. Normally we're somewhere between 0.3 and 0.4. These are typical values for a civil gas turbine aircraft. Here we've got something similar, but these are for propeller aircraft, so we have to plot the power to weight ratio here. This is in different units of kilowatts per kilonewton, and it's been converted to uh, the thrust to weight ratio. And again, when it's, once it's converted, you'll notice a similar value, somewhere between 0.3 and 0.4. Similarly, if we look at uh, acquiring data for the wing loading of various types of aircraft, well, you'll see a bit more of a variation here. As the aircraft gets larger, then you will get larger wings and you'll get larger weights and the wing loading starts to increase. Nevertheless, if you know you're designing a small executive jet, you know the wing loading is roughly around about 2,000. If you know that you're gen like designing a much smaller single engine piston engine for instance you know that your wing loading is somewhere in this range so you, you have good starting values you know for instance your thrust to weight ratio is going to be around about 0.3 or 0.4 and you can select a, a, an appropriate starting value for your wing loading here and you would use these values to input into your design calculations that follow next so in summary, you can see the importance of these two variables. It means that we can start to estimate them from historical data because there's quite a lot of consistency in them. And you can use that as a valid starting point for design calculations that follow next. So if you know the thrust to weight ratio, the T over W, and you know the maximum takeoff weight, then therefore it's not a huge step then to work out the thrust. And then from the thrust you can then start to select different proportion units for your design. Similarly, if you know your wing loading, your W over S, and therefore, and if you're starting off by knowing what your aircraft mass is, and hence the weight, you can then work out what the area is S. So it's a starting point to work out and size up the aircraft as a whole, something that we'll cover in our following videos and tutorials. So this video is from Ireland Engineering, it's part of uh, a small part of one of our courses in aeronautical engineering. We have lots of courses, diplomas, higher international certificates and higher international diplomas and you'll find them all on our website, I